It's my nerd world and Depeche Mode, the podcast. This week on the episode, Dave Gone covers a, a new song just released, uh, streaming today, I believe, even though it's been out um, available for the past uh, few days. Uh, Radio.co.uk puts out an article, What Are Depeche Mode's Biggest Songs? Also, uh, Classic Pop Magazine. I enjoy their posts on Instagram quite a bit. They put out an album spotlight, and this week it was Delta Machine. So I will share with you some thoughts on that, and then we'll dive into your listener feedback. Hello, this is Martin Gore from Depeche Mode. Hi, this is Dave Garn from Depeche Mode, and you are listening to My Nerd Road. Welcome to it. Depeche Mode, the podcast. I'm your host, John Justice. Thank you so much for checking out this week's episode. If you want to email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com. And thank you to those who did this past week. We'll get to your listener feedback here in just a little bit. I was on a Christmas island in my Memento Mori goth masterpiece take from last week's episode. See what I did there? I was on an island. I was on a Christmas island. Yeah, no takers. In my apparently lukewarm take of Memento Mori being a goth record and uh, Depeche Mode's place within uh, goth, traditional goth music. That's okay. It is not the only time in the past week that I have found myself sort of alone when it comes to things that, um, when it comes to hot takes or that which interests me. If you were uh, paying attention at all, depending on whether or not you're listening to this stateside or listening to this overseas, we had some hearings up on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., relating to the alleged existence of UFOs or what we now call UAPs, Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon, um, a, a military um, intelligence officer, two former um, fighter pilots, both testified under oath in front of Congress of experiencing these UAPs uh, firsthand. And as a matter of fact, one of the individuals actually when questioned under oath, claimed that we had recovered um, actual non-human pilots of some of these craft. And I was fascinated by this, and I talked about it on my radio show that I do full-time, and yeah, I was all alone. (laughs) There were some people that were interested, but clearly not as much as I was. So I'm not sure which one I got the colder takeover, whether it was my my goth, probably the goth take, because I didn't get any response off off of uh, that at all. And that's, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. But again, thank you so much for checking out this week's episode. I just got back from, um, and this is Depeche Mode related, by the way. I just got back from doing um, some mountain biking with my 16-year-old. Got off the air and then met up with him. His mom drove out to the trails. And uh, I met up with him once we got off the air and did some trail riding and we're driving home. And just an absolutely beautiful uh, summer day here in Minnesota. Just completely uh, clear skies, highs in the 80s. It was much hotter um, yesterday. But driving into work this morning, I had my iPod on shuffle. And uh, it uh, landed on um, Electronic and their debut album. And I started playing some tracks from that. And that album from Electronic always takes me back to the World Violation Tour. And going into Los Angeles uh, way early with my group of friends in my father's tan, I think it was a 71 uh, Volkswagen bus. Listening to uh, that album on cassette while listening to other music of the day in uh, in the late 90s. I think we're in the 90s. Yeah, 1990. Um, June of 1990, actually. Uh, getting ready to head to Dodger Stadium for the World Violation Tour. And it got me thinking of those those days when you go see the band. And for those of you that have already had a chance to go see Depeche Mode on this tour, you know what I'm what I'm talking about, but those that those days from the moment you get up, knowing you're going to go and see Depeche Mode, especially on a weekend, leading up to it, um, they're just they're special days. And driving home, I'm sitting there with my son, and I was just um, remembering fondly back to those summer days, uh, leading up to those night shows as the sun would go down and Depeche Mode would go and take the stage. I've actually been watching. They're not great, but there are a few um, a few videos available on YouTube from the World Violation Tour. And I've, I've mentioned this recently, that um, Brat, 
from sort of the Depeche Mode PR group, a fan of the show for, for decades. Um, he has put out all of the clips um, that are available, <clears throat> the professional shots from the cameras that shot the show to put them up on the side screens. Very similar to uh, what happened with the Barcelona uh, live stream about a month or so ago. And it's about, I think it's a little over a half hour long. I think I've mentioned it before. But um, yeah, just just thinking about those days, thinking back to 101 and the Rose Bowl, um, again, being a, <laughs> an incredibly young 15 years old, but going and tailgating in the parking lot of the Rose Bowl, heading into that show as the sun, um, again, begins to uh, begins to go down. And then we, of course, ended up watching that that amazing uh, that amazing show my apologies there my phone was freaking out i had it on silent mode and it was still going off i have no idea why probably telling me to stop my rambling and get to some actual depeche mode news so i'll go ahead and do that i'm in a good mood so probably all the uh from my my uh my post ride, the endorphins running through me from my post mountain bike ride. Uh, Dave Gone covers the Gun Club's Mother Earth. Uh, several of you had actually sent this uh, to me. I think Rob Rome um, from the Global Depeche Fan Group was the first one that ended up sending it uh, my my way. He was, as a matter of fact, and I will get to to some details on this for those that haven't heard it yet. But I had mentioned on last week's show the version of but not tonight that took martin gore's vocals and then put a music track on top of it and it took me about two days because i had some people bugging me to see if we could find it it took me about two days to locate it but i finally found it and it was different than it, it, it's the same song that I'd heard before, but the um, the graphic that was used for it was different. So I had to really spend a lot of time searching um, through just Google and looking through just a whole bunch of not great, but not tonight remixes. And I finally found it. And what I realized, and I hadn't heard it in probably about a year and a half, what I realized had made this version so special because I sent it to. Um, a uh, a friend of the show who had messaged me on Twitter, and he picked up on the reason why I enjoyed it so much is because it used almost all live instruments, um, and it just it, it just it has a very organic and yet still cinematic feel to it. So if you're interested in hearing it, I will go ahead and post a link in the notes for this week's um, episode. That's what I'll do. Uh, and for those that are for those that are interested in checking it out, I still have notes from uh, or links up from some other items, the drinking chat that I did with Rob, um, uh, I guess about two months ago. That's still available on there. The documentary um, that uh, that that I found as well that was re-released originally called the posters um, came from the walls and it was retitled Our Hobby is Depeche Mode. So uh, I'll make a note now. Uh, to put a link in for this, uh, but not tonight. I don't even want to say remix. It's almost just a reworking. Again, it took Martin's vocals from the Delta Machine tour and then put uh, live instruments behind it. It's absolutely fantastic. So, again, I'll put that in the notes. All right. So, in an old interview um, with regard to Soul Savers, I think it came out in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Dave actually talked about this cover that he was going to record. He said there was one song we were going to record for the Imposters record uh, from the Gun Club, a Jeffrey Lee Pierce song. We were going to do Mother of Earth. I sort of couldn't find a place for it, so we didn't end up recording it. Uh, but recently it came back to me a few months ago from a separate interview. Uh, Susie Stapleton asked me to join the Jeffrey Lee Pierce sessions to cover one of his songs, Mother Earth. I played a little guitar on it, and it was a lot of fun. Sometimes I feel like I found my own voice that way. Dave's vocals on it are fantastic. Um, he sounds amazing. And the video itself, to see Dave playing a guitar to the song was really unique and, and cool. Uh, I'll be honest, the song didn't really do anything for me, but Dave Gaughan's solo stuff and his stuff with Soul Savers um, didn't really ever click with me either. And the one thing listening to the cover that really stood out was it made me, again, appreciate the production work of Memento Mori because this um, cover of the Gun Club's Mother of Earth 
is very sort of your just your, just your basic drum guitars and um, very little programming or anything special in terms of the production work. And it works well for the song and the type of song that it is. But it just made me think, listening to Memento Mori as much as I have been, um, just how um, how much depth there is to the production work on Memento Mori. So if you haven't checked it out, it's been released officially, and I believe it's even available on the streaming platforms uh, now as well. So I definitely go and uh, and check that out. So as I typically do with the show, um, I look to see if uh, anything has been released over the course of the past week. I do some internet searches and um, as of late, it really has just been reviews of the shows as the tour continues overseas. But on occasion, you pick up on some new articles that get released. And this one came from the radio.co.uk. And I always find it interesting when an outlet goes and compiles a list, a list of Depeche Mode songs um, and gives you their opinion on them. So um, I wanted to share this with you. One of the things that I was a little bit bummed about is they didn't give a criteria the article's titled, What are Depeche Mode's Biggest Songs? And I thought maybe they were going off of um, its chart position, but it really just seems more like they came up with their own criteria. And there's no really real set standard here. So I'll run through this with you. I thought it was interesting. Um, the British band's ongoing Memento Mori tour is their biggest yet, and they'll be returning to the UK this year. Which So which tracks in their extensive catalog, are the most popular. First off, they say, Enjoy the Silence, released February 5th of 1990. Released a month before its parent, Violator, in 1990, this mode classic only made it to number six in the UK charts at the time, but its reputation has grown over the years. Enjoy the Silence has since, since notched 572 million Spotify plays, 376 million YouTube views, and has been given platinum status in Germany, Italy, and Denmark, and earning gold discs in Sweden, Portugal, and the U.S. internationally. It's Depeche Mode's biggest hit, even making it number one on the Spanish charts. Okay, so maybe this is a culmination of record sales and chart positions. So it gives this, uh, it gives it a little bit more... Um, validity. A Personal Jesus, released August 29th of 1989, comes in number two on the list. Uh, the band's final single of the 80s was a preview for the Mammoth Violator album uh, that would appear in the early months of the new uh, decade. The Anton Corbin video was watched, let's see, 175 million times on YouTube, and between the different versions available, the track has been played 364 million times on Spotify. Next up, Just Can't Get Enough, released September 7th, 1981. The band's first platinum disc in the UK, the 90, 1981 single, still only made it to number one. It's an initial release. Its popularity has grown the four decades since, however, with over 330 million streams on Spotify, 75 million views on, on YouTube. Next up at number four, Never Let Me Down Again, August 24th, 1987. After the track from 87 was used in the first season, uh, the first season episode of the HBO series The Last of Us in 2023, streams of the song tripled overnight. It now has 103 million streams on Spotify, and the incredibly atmospheric video has notched 92 million views. Anton Corbin told Radio X that he was in the process of remastering the short film Strange, from which Never Let Me Down Again video is taken for a Blu-ray release. How in the world did I miss that? Holy cow. I almost feel like this is the biggest equivalent to breaking news that I could ever... That I, that, that I could ever have on the, on the show. Had anybody else heard this? Also shows you that I honestly don't look through a lot of this stuff. I like to keep it fresh. So Anton Corbin told, and this just came out this week, Radio X said he's in the process of remastering the short film Strange, from which Never Let Me Down Again, the video was taken for a Blu-ray release. Please tell me they're going to do Strange 2 as well. Oh, man, that would be amazing. That would be absolutely amazing. Wow, I got to retitle the podcast now. I got to make a note. Well, I hadn't put the notes out yet, but okay, so strange. Holy cow. Anybody? I had not heard that yet. Exclusive, right here, on my nerd world. Depeche Mode, 
the podcast. What else are we going to find out while we're reading this? Wow. I would have led with that for crying out loud. Well, that would be awesome. That would really be awesome. I, 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 if you're like me, Strange and Strange 2, those are special releases. They really, really are. Especially Strange, because that was a time when we were all clamoring for Depeche Mode, right? Sort of as they were achieving the height of their power. And it was that that short film, Strange, really opened my eyes as, you know, as a teenager to be a little bit more open-minded to what, you know, I was entertained by. So, I mean, to get that on Blu-ray and remastered would be absolutely incredible. All right. Wow. Uh, Policy of Truth comes in at number five after that little, after that little nugget released <laughs> May seventh of nineteen uh, ninety. Uh, let's see, oh, I'm losing my, I'm losing my, I'm losing my track here. Uh, the third single, single from uh, Violator, the original single, didn't make it to the UK top ten. It peaked at sixteen, but in more recent years, the song has amassed 98 million Spotify streams, 96 million YouTube views. And I've mentioned this before. I found an odd thread in the run up to Memento Mori where people I didn't realize that 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 policy of truth was apparently divisive. Because there's a lot of fans that don't like that song. I I personally I hadn't seen any negativity towards it, and then I found this thread over on the uh, the home depeche dash mode dot com on the uh, home message board, and found out there was a lot of people that that do not like that song, and I was completely unaware of it. I love Policy of Truth. All right, uh, coming in at uh, number six, uh, Precious, released October third of two thousand and five. I'm still giddy over Strange being get coming out on Blu-ray. <laughs> Um, a gold record in Germany, a top five UK hit, the single from 2005 from Playing the Angel, also was also a number one hit in Denmark, Italy, Spain, and Sweden. It's had 107 million Spotify streams and 70 million YouTube views to date. Uh, coming in at number seven, Strange Love, April 27th, 1987, released in the spring of that year as a trailer for the band's six album, Music for the Masses. Strange Love was a huge alternative club hit, making it a top 10 um, hit in Denmark, Finland, Ireland, Sweden, Switzerland, and West Germany in recent years. It's, uh, it, it's achieved 71 million Spotify streams and 100 million YouTube views. Coming in at uh, number eight... It's No Good, released March 31st of 1987, the second uh, second single from Ultra, made uh, number five in the UK and topped the charts in Sweden, Spain, in uh, Italy, and Denmark. The track has achieved 70 million Spotify streams and 300, uh, 35 million excuse me, views on YouTube. Now, coming in at number nine, People Are People, March 12th, 1984. I've mentioned recently I've uh, turned a corner on that song and really find myself listening to it more than I had in decades Awarded a silver disc in the UK, peaking at number four on the charts uh, in the UK. Uh, this memorable tune was also the first mode track to break the US top 20 back in 84. Huge year for pop culture. Uh, it's now notched to 65 million Spotify streams and 34 million YouTube views. Yeah, and so this was right around the time, you know, like I was aware of People Are People at the time, but I really hadn't become a huge fan. It wasn't until I heard Shake the Disease that I really zeroed in on the band. So I had actually been exposed to Depeche Mode before that with People Are People, but just it wasn't a song that really did much for me. That year of 1984 was just such a massive year when it comes to pop culture in terms of um, music, Michael Jackson Thriller, you have Beverly Hills Cop in the movie theaters, you've got Terminator, just to name a few. Uh, just a huge, huge year. And then coming in at number 10, Everything Counts released July 11th of 1983. Lead single from 83's Construction Time Again has gone on to become a favorite at Depeche Mode live shows. Originally peaking at number 6 in the charts, the single um, was awarded silver status by BPI and has received 35 million YouTube views, 60 million Spotify streams to date. I'm going to jump ahead to some listener feedback since we are talking uh, charts and um, want to uh, want to share this uh, with you. Museo um, Museo Depeche Mode um, at Museo Depeche Mode, uh, which was taken from Strange of all things, uh, says that Depeche Mode has officially broken the Beatles' record. Memento Mori 
is the 12th Depeche Mode album to reach number one, the number one position in Germany. No other international band has hit the top of the album charts more often in this country, so congratulations to Depeche. Stephanie, a uh, friend of the show from the Baltic Coast, writes... Uh, and she's the one that ended up sharing this with me. So thank you, Stephanie. I admit that I didn't. I, I don't really care if the band I love is in the charts or not, because as the time between releases gets longer and longer, it was often the case that Depeche Mode didn't show up in the charts. Still, I'm proud to be a part of this success story and to have 12 albums at number one in the charts in Germany is already an enormous achievement. As we... Uh, may all know, not every album has ignited. I don't even know who is the gauge for that. The fans or just the people who are not fans, but who buy the album because it's really good. There's really good music on it. I take my hat off to the musical achievement of this band, and I will always hold the flag high for Depeche Mode. They are one in a million. That's it for me. Hope you have a fantastic summer. All the best, Stephanie. Thank you very much, Stephanie, for that. I greatly um, appreciate it. So I uh, decided to do something in the wake of this top 10 list, which revealed that I'm still kind of shocked. That's really exciting. That kind of gives me a little bit of hope that maybe we will get something from World Violation. But, I mean, I never thought that the band would bother to go back to Strange and put together a blue uh, a, a Blu-ray release of that. So perhaps they're looking at something a box set or a combination Blu-ray of their past releases on one. I mean, that would be fantastic. If we got a Blu-ray release that included Strange and Strange 2 on it, I would just be giddy. Wow. I'm super excited. Now I want to go watch 101. <laughs> I couldn't tell you the last time I actually watched Strange. I'm sure there's a there's a rip of it online or, you know, it on YouTube. But, I mean, last time I probably watched it was last time I had a VHS player, which has, again, been decades. So I decided to do my own little test. And I would encourage you to do the same thing. Um, uh, friend of the show, Matt. <laughs> friend of mine, I'm talking to you. All right, so here's the rules. I wanted to put together my own top. 10 list of my biggest Depeche Mode songs, but I gave myself 30 seconds to make the list. I wanted to know what songs would immediately fill the 30 seconds, which so basically desert Island, you know, your, your desert Island, your Christmas Island Depeche Mode list. You can only take 10 songs with you. You've got 10 seconds before you get on the boat and you can only have these 10, these 10 songs. Which ones do you choose? Go. So this was my this was my list. 30 seconds, 10 songs. This is what I wrote. Ghosts again, enjoy the silence. Here is the house. Walking in my shoes. It doesn't matter. Everything counts. Useless question of lust. World in my eyes and shake the disease. I was actually surprised that everything counts landed on that on that list. I think it's because I was frustrated with Melinda, my wife, because she said that she was listening to I don't remember what she was. I think she was listening to the 80s channel on Sirius XM or something. And Everything Counts popped on, and she was kind of ripping it. <laughs> she was like, I knew the song, but it just it's really dated. And I go, I still absolutely adore that song. So, again, that was my top ten list. Ghost again, enjoy the silence. Here is the house. Uh, walking in my shoes. It doesn't matter. Everything counts. Useless. Question of lust. World in my eyes and shake the disease. So, I challenge you. 30 seconds. Don't think about it. Put a timer out. Ten songs. Go. All right. This was an interesting read. I only read portion of it, uh, a portion of it. And once I kind of got through a couple of paragraphs, I was like, oh, I'll share this on the show. Um, with echoes of both Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion, the Mode's 13th studio album, Delta Machine, would be considered by fans as a late period classic, writes Classic Pop Magazine even if the critics couldn't make up their minds. Well, that's interesting. I don't hear a lot of people talk about Delta Machine all that much. It is an album that I've revisited and enjoyed quite a bit. When Depeche Mode reconvened in 2012 to begin work on their 13th album, all three members were coming off of solo ventures. Dave Gaughan spent the first, had spent a few years with Soul Savers. Martin Gore had reunited with Vince Clark for VCMG, which I really enjoy. Uh, Fletch continued to perform DJ sets around the world. 
With all that out of their system, they were ready to fin uh, finish off their trilogy of albums with producer Ben Hillier. And of course, we've talked about Delta Machine recently because of the demos that got released and just how dramatically different the demos were from the actual album. In the press, the band teased the record as sounding like a cross between Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion. Coincidentally, their biggest selling albums. And it's true that Delta Machine does share some oral DNA with those titans. It's gothic electronica, some of the most accomplished of Mode's career. Recorded in Santa Barbara, California and New York City with Hillier. The album was mixed by was then mixed by Flood, who had worked with the band previously on both Violator and Songs of Faith and Devotion. Um, forgive me for not knowing that Flood mixed Delta Machine. Was I not? How how did I'm a bad Depeche Mode fan? How was I not aware of that fact? Well, I'll be. I grabbed my disc out, and uh, sure enough, there it is, mixed by Flood for 140 dB. I, maybe I did see that, and I didn't make much much note of it. I just I was not interesting. That's gonna give a. I'm gonna have to listen to that with a different ear than I have in quite a long time. All right, let's get back to the um, article here from Classic Pop Magazine. Though the album was str uh, stridently electronic, Gone admitted to Time Magazine that the blues were a big influence on his writing and recording. Listen to Goodbye and Slow, actually written during the sessions, for Songs of Faith and Devotion, and you'll hear some uncharacteristically, certainly for Depeche Mode, bluesy guitar riffs. And of course, um, this was something that I know uh, many people kind of were getting burned on because we had this for a long time. And it makes me laugh because there's a line in here. Um, the title Delta Machine describes it, though. Uh, describes it, though. It's influenced by the blues, but it's made by uh, machines. The line that they wrote from Classic Pop Magazine is, you'll hear some uncharacteristically, certainly for Depeche Mode, bluesy guitar riffs, seems completely off the mark. I mean, you can go back to Violator to talk about how the band was keying in on on blues and it was actually something that i know a lot of people including myself were really hoping for with memento mori that it wouldn't have any sort of blues tinge to it um and certainly they pulled way back on the album and i think the album really benefits because of that um it's what we do and this album embraces that more than the last couple so even gone admits that they've been doing it for a while so why they said uncharacteristically i do not know Every album leads you to the next one somehow. Sometimes you make a record and you're not quite sure what you're making, but you find out when you make the next one. The first taste fans had of the reunited Depeche Mode was the simmering ballad Heaven, released seven weeks before the album. Um, and their first since the seven-inch single of Fragile Tension Hole to Feed back in December of 2009. According to Gore, Heaven was written on a piano. I had all the chords and everything all worked out on the piano and the vocal melody and the lyrics worked out before I went anywhere near a computer. In the press notes that accompanied the single, Gone um, said about the track, of all the incredible songs that Martin has written over the years that I have been lucky enough to sing and perform, once in a while a song comes along. Hopefully I'll write one of those myself one day. That's something I have to sing. It's something I want to sing. To me, Heaven is one of the reasons why I still make music. And it, for me personally, it's one of the most underwhelming singles they've ever released. I don't mind it so much now. I don't skip it as I would before if I'm listening to the album. Um, but certainly did not grab me even upon release. Martin and I felt it represented the record in a lot of ways, which is why we wanted to put it out first. Gone told time. It's not like we felt it was going to be a big hit or something, but that doesn't really drive us to make music. We all like to have hits. It's nice to have hits, of course, but after making 13 records together, it's not what drives you. On Delta Machine, Gone continued in his role as a songwriter that began in 2005's Playing the Angel, penning three of the album's 13 tracks, Secret to the End, and the, including uh, 13 tracks, including Secret to the End, and the third single should be Higher. I was out Christmas Eve at a nice restaurant. Everyone's drinking, the singer told Mojo. I thought, why can't I just have a glass of wine. But I don't anymore, because even one glass of wine opens a whole Pandora's box. My mind immediately thinks I can go much higher. That's what a should be higher is about, that line. The lies are more attractive than the truth. I still draw on that stuff when I'm singing and performing to dig my way out of trouble. 
Delta Machine's other single would be Soothe My Soul, a techno-pop number with some sly allusions to personal Jesus. Unfortunately, none of the singles performed well commercially, though the band itself would, the, the, excuse me, the album itself would peak at number two in the UK. Number six in America and top the charts in Austria, Germany, Italy, and Sweden. Reviews were, as usual at this time, in Depeche Mode careers mixed. Uh, there is not a single moment of shock or freshness on Delta Machine, and it's enormously frustrating to hear what was once a band of futurists so deeply mired in resisting change, wrote Pitchfork. While the Independent opined that the problem with ponderous electropomp is that as soon as the uh, meniscus of self-importance is pricked, goodness gracious, did you get a thesaurus out for that one? The meniscus of self-importance is pricked. Pinky's up. Holy cow. I don't think I've read a line that snobbish. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's just the meniscus of self-importance is pricked. All right. Uh, it collapses into rise ability. Oh, that makes it even better. One more time. As soon as the meniscus of self-importance is pricked, it collapses into risability. <laughs> As on Depeche Mode's weakest album in some while. Wow. <laughs> if I ever start a band, guys, I'm going to call it meniscus of self-importance. <laughs> risability? Risab I don't even know. What is, what is that? I'm going to have to grab the dictionary. For All right. Sorry. <sighs> How much more satisfying their records would be if they weren't eternally blade, bathed in bleakness, wrote The Guardian. Wow, these are incredibly bad. Every ponderous electric clank is full of it. Every sonorous syllable gone sings denies the possibility that life can be uncomplicated, even enjoyable. I have not written, I have not read reviews like this in a while. I don't remember the, th those for Memento Mori being as pompous as these ones. <laughs> Others, however, were more positive. Unlike The Strokes, other uh, another ostensibly nostalgic act playing out when it, waning variations of their past glories, Depeche Mode knows their place, wrote Slant. More importantly, they're comfortable with it, which means that unlike the uneven, root, uh, rootless come down machine, the Strokes' fifth studio album, Delta Machine, has a satisfying air of a perfected formula. The AV Club were similarly impressed. Unlike many veteran acts to their own past, Depeche Mode doesn't sound like it's repeating itself or out of ideas. The group has merely remembered what made it great in the first place. Wow, I almost want to retitle. I'm going to put the strange um, Blu-ray release as the title now, but I almost, I almost want to retitle, retitle it "Meniscus of Self-Importance." Oh, I know. I'm probably on an island again, just laughing all by myself. All right, let's get to your listener feedback this week. Travis Hill writes. I feel the same way about Memento Mori as you. It has zero burn for me, and the last two records were about three listens and done. I find myself listening to this record at least two to three times a week. That's a blessing here that I mention in the subject line. Now for the curse, and I'm curious on your thoughts here. Does the success of this record almost help Dave walk away from DM after this tour? We all know that they don't plan anything until they do, and Dave is on record in many interviews, talking uh, about not wanting to be doing this when he's 70 and calling it quits once they feel they've made a great record and can go out on top. The fans and the media alike seem to all love the record, and the live reviews have been great. So, is this the time he says goodbye, singing the melody of Everybody Says Goodbye from Ghosts Again? I mean, he's now 61, almost, or will be 62 by the time the tour ends. A four- or five-year break, he's 66, 67. I hope I'm wrong, because I think they have just proven that they have a lot to offer, and the demand for the band is at an all-time high. I'm enjoying every minute of this go-around, seeing three shows already, one with my 15-year-old daughter at Madison Square Garden in New York, and we'll be going to Dallas for a, uh, uh, for a show later this year and eyeing an overseas trip for 2024. You know, I don't know. It seems as if Martin and Dave are getting on 
incredibly well. They seem to be really enjoying the tour. They've obviously gone and extended the tour. And in the passing of Fletch, it seems like Dave has taken on a bigger role. They certainly like the produ- the production team they've put together. So, I don't know. I, I, I guess I had initially thought that this would be the end with Memento Mori, but something tells me that with the band um, and the success of this record and their creativity in making the album at an all-time high, that I wonder if whether or not they have more in them. We know that there's another four songs that are fully produced for this record. They're clearly, as I mentioned before, for what it's worth, the discovery of finding out they're going to be remastering some of their old works to put out on Blu-ray. So um, they're obviously looking to capitalize on the success they're having right now. And this time just seemed very different. It seemed... It seems like the opening of a new chapter, not the closing of an of a of a of an of, 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 of an old chapter. That's I guess that's what I'm driving at. This doesn't seem like the end. I mean, maybe the the you know the the closing of a chapter in the passing of Fletch, but it really does seem like the opening of a new chapter, even though you know, the, the band is getting is getting older. So I, I don't know. I certainly feel different about the future of the band than I did um, right before Memento Mori was released, and I'm more positive about it, but we'll see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Krista, uh, Withering Flower Child writes, Hello again. I hope you're doing well. I am. I was glad to hear your reference to Memento Mori and vampires. All right, so at least somebody got my vision for Don't Say You Love Me as opposed to, <laughs> to my... Apparently, atrocious goth take. Okay, maybe I'm being too hard on myself. I was very much into the vampire scene for many years until my pastor told me that vampires are evil and I had to throw away all my vampire stuff, including my artwork. Oh, no. I, don't, I think, you know, I, well, I won't get into it. I, I get it, you know, being, being raised in a staunch Christian household. But at the same time, you know, everything is, it all depends on how it affects you, right? Anyways, okay. Well, you do what you think is best, Krista. I'm definitely not going to throw away Memento Mori. I'm a serious Martin fan. So I tend to like the songs where he sings heavy backing vocal, vocals, like Wagging Tongue or solos like Soul With Me. His voice is smooth, off, uh, is smooth, soft, crushed velvet sex. Yum. Maybe you need to go talk to your pastor again. <laughs> I'd like to hear more about him in your podcast. Thank you, and God bless you. P.S. Thanks for the book. I can't wait to read it. I, I hope you enjoy it, Krista, and I'm glad that it got to you uh, safely. Um, yeah, you know what? I should really spend I'll, – I'll take a podcast in the near future um, on, a, on a week. Instead of doing bad hot takes, I'll spend some time focusing on Martin Gore songs. How's that sound? When I was going through all of my collectibles, I found a bunch of CDs that I had burned back when that was a thing, making compilation discs. And um, I probably mentioned this on the show, but anyways, I forget. But I had found these. I had found ones that were all B-sides, all Martin songs. Oh, they were great. But unfortunately, time had taken their toll on the discs, and they unfortunately were not playable anymore, which really bummed me out. All right, we got one more listener feedback this week. Hi, John. Loving the podcast. Thank you. It's refreshing to hear your perspective of Memento Mori and the current state of the band. I have to agree with your sentiment that this is a really exciting time in DM history. My love for DM began in my childhood and with my earliest memory dating back to 1984. I recall sitting in the back of my parents' car as we drove home from visiting my aunt. My mom was a huge music fan and would blast popular radio uh, at the time called Z100. People Are People was just released as a single and played constantly. My sister and I would go crazy every time it would come on during the long ride home. Another fond memory of DM was the first time I saw the video for Enjoy the Silence. It was on a random Saturday night, and my parents let us stay up late to watch music videos on NBC uh, after Saturday Night Live, all of a sudden that music video started and I was taken on a sensory joyride. I was totally enthralled by not only the song, but the visuals in that video. Anton Corbin is the man. Now, as I head towards middle age, it resonates with me just how much this band has left imprints on my specific moments, on specific moments in my life. It's refreshing to hear you discuss how much the band means to you. 
It is a downer sometimes how little music seems to be cherished and shared between people in our current culture. It can be a bit isolating at times when you think you're the only person listening to an album like Memento Mori, making your podcast that much more appreciated. Thank you so much for the kind words. Keep up the good work and know that your podcast is the cherry on my Memento Mori Sunday for your listeners. Delicious. I'm going to see Depeche Mode in October on their two New York area dates, and I cannot wait. I hope they add some additional songs from Memento Mori. It would be a welcome change to switch out a selection like John the Revelator with a track like People Are Good or Don't Say You Love Me. Yes. Lastly, I wonder if you have uh, if you have ever heard Dave Guest on an album on a Project Mirror. Yes. Um, nostalgia. Well, I'll get back to that in a second. Yes, the song... He is featured on, it's called Nostalgia, and it's one of the most beautiful vocals ever delivered by Dave. I highly recommend, if you can, get a hold of that entire album. It really is a masterpiece. Thank you, Evan in New Jersey. Evan, uh, thank you so much for uh, the listener feedback and the email. And I honestly, somebody who's gone through the podcast recently will have to tell me, I don't think I've ever talked about Nostalgia. However... Um, I'm glad Evan brought it up because if I haven't, that's a crime. I love that song. Nostalgia is a song that I wish that I wish was a Depeche Mode song. I adore that song. It is probably my favorite ever non Depeche Mode track by any of the band members from Mirror. Um, and, and, and again, I just, every time I hear it, I go, man, I wish, not that it matters, right? Of course. I mean, hat tip to Mirror and Dave's singing of that song, but that, that is a, that is a song that resonates. Not only is it an incredible song to listen to, but it's one of those ones that just wholly resonates, uh, with me. Um, it's absolutely beautiful. So if you've never heard it, um, stop, just stop right now and come back later. I'm done anyway. Um, and, uh, and go. Go and uh, go check it out. Trust me, you will not be um, disappointed. All right, and that wraps up the show for this week. As always, if you want to support my nerd world and you like science fiction and you haven't yet, please check out my science fiction space opera series, Embark. Set in the future where air and space flight culture has replaced car culture, inspired in part by Depeche Mode, life in the so-called space age, the world we live in, and life in general. Depeche Mode plays a large part in the underlying themes of the story. The main character himself, which is no surprise based a little bit on me, is a massive DM fan at the time when the music of the 80s through the 2000s is nostalgic and popular among the characters of the story. Think uh, Ready Player One in terms of its references. The stories feature references of Depeche Mode, both direct and indirect, while telling an exciting science fiction space opera saga. It really is written in the vein of sort of your pulp space opera classics. If you're looking for hard science fiction, you're not going to find that in Embark. If you like your science fiction to be pulpy, epic, with some romance and filled with action, then Embark is perfect for you. It's written for adults, but great for ages 11 plus. Seven books in all in the series, available in ebook, hardcover, paperback, and audiobook. Amazon.com or MyNerdWorld.net is where you can go and check it out. And if you want to purchase paperbacks of any of the books in the series from me directly, and I will autograph them, and they're a little bit cheaper uh, than purchasing them from uh, Amazon because I can. Uh, it's cheaper for me to ship them. I've got a whole box of them here at home. Just email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, and I will uh, let you know how to pay for it, and I'll get that in the mail within less than a week. So, again, thank you so much for checking out the show. Uh, support my nerd world. Pick up uh, my science fiction series. And, again, I hope wherever you are, you are happy, you are healthy, and you are safe. I'll talk to you again next week. Bye.